day and welcome to this next lesson on physical science. In this lesson we're going to carry on looking at uh, chemical bonding. We've been looking at different types of bonding and we've been looking at covalent bonding and looking at Lewis um, dot notation and in this lesson we're going to carry on with ionic bonding. So the first thing you need to be aware of is that there is a thing called electronegativity and by now you should know that electric negativity is a property of an atom that describes how strongly the atom attracts or holds onto electrons. Okay so some atoms hold on very strongly to the atoms and they also attract other electrons to them. Okay, and if they do that, then they have a very high electronegativity, whereas if they give away the electrons freely and they don't really hold on to the electrons and they don't attract other electrons, then they have a very low electronegativity. So if you look at the table, you can see that the electronegativity now. This is obviously a periodic table, but your periodic tables that you guys get during the exams don't actually look quite like this because this periodic table is specifically looking at the electronegativity. And you will see that over here we've got fluorine, which is a 4, and over here we've got francium, which is 0 0.7. And that is the range. It ranges from 0 0.7 up to 4. Okay, so what happens is, is we measure the difference in electronegativity between two atoms. And if it's greater than 1.7, then we say that it's um, ionically bonded. Okay, so basically if the electronegativity difference, electronegativity difference is greater than 1.7, then we say it is ionically bonded okay and you guys don't have to worry about how they decided on these numbers all you need to know is that what actually happened was that they gave fluorine the specific value of four and then they compared all the other atoms that you can see here to fluorine and basically did a ratio thing so fluorine is the most electronegative okay and your francium is the least okay so francium is the most reactive Okay, so now let's see how you would work out the formation of sodium chloride. So first of all, you need to know that sodium chloride is Na and Cl. Okay, so what we do is we look at the electronegativity of sodium, which is Na, and we see that that is 0 0,9. Okay, then we go look for the electronegativity of chlorine, and that is 3. Okay, 3. Right, so now we do the difference and it, we always obviously go bigger minus smaller. So it's 3 minus 0, 0,9 which is 2, 1 which then obviously means that this is electronegative. It obviously means that it's electronegative. I mean ionic, sorry. It obviously means it's ionic um, because we just said that if it's bigger than 1.7 then it is ionic. Um, grade 10. Some textbooks say 1.9 and some say 1.7, but it depends on your textbook and your teachers to which one you go with. But the range is basically, it is 1.7. So this is ionic. Okay, so we now know that it's ionic bonding. Okay, so now we've said that sodium is in group 1, right? So if it's in group 1, it's got one valence electron, which means that sodium, remember what ionic bonding is? Ionic bonding is the transfer of electrons. It's a transfer, not the sharing. The sharing is covalent. So it's a transfer of electrons. So what's going to happen is sodium is the small has the smaller of the two electronegativities, right? So it's going to hold on to its electrons less strongly, okay? And chlorine is going to attract the electrons to it, okay? So sodium is going to give its electrons away, and chlorine is going to attract the electrons to it. So what happens is you can see that here that sodium is in group one, so it's got one valence electron. So the sodium gives away its one electron to become a sodium plus ion. And it is a cation, and it's a cation because it's positively charged. And why? Because an electron is 
negatively charged. So if you give it away, then this becomes positively charged. Chlorine is in group seven, right? Chlorine is in group seven. So therefore it's got seven valence electrons. So in order to become like a noble gas, what does it want to do? It will want to gain an electron. So there's your chlorine and it's got your seven electrons. It gains the electron that was given off by the sodium and it now becomes a negatively charged ion, which isn't called an anion. Okay, and the way that I remember this is, and I think I told you this last time as well, cation, the T looks like a plus, and anion, okay, is for like negative, okay, which is what, exactly what it is. So cation is positively charged, and then anion is negatively charged, right? So this is an anion because it's now negatively charged. The way we write it is we say that the sodium plus ion and the chloride minus ion join together to form a structure, okay? So they don't actually combine because you must remember that these are huge crystal lattices, okay? They don't actually form a molecule, single molecule, they form a whole bunch of molecules joined together in a big crystal lattice. So what we show is that this sodium has now become a sodium plus and the chloride has become a chloride minus ion and they are sitting next to each other because they are now electrostatically attracted. The reaction that we would write would be 2 sodium plus chlorine goes to 2 sodium chloride. And the reason for this is remember that chlorine is a diatomic molecule in real life. So what happens is the chlorine breaks up into a chloride and a chloride atom or chlorine atom and chlorine atom. Then you have that reaction, the previous reaction where the sodium reacts with the chlorine, but obviously then we need two sodiums to join up with each of the chlorines to give you two sodium chloride. Okay, let's now look at the formation of magnesium oxide. Okay, so let's do something different. Let's look at magnesium oxide. So let's look at the electronegativity of magnesium. Magnesium is in group two, and it has electronegativity of 1,3. Oxygen, is 3,5, 3,5. So if we go 3,5 minus 1,3, what do we get? This is a 2 and that is a 2. So that electronegativity difference is 2,2. 2. So again, this is obviously ionic, obviously. So now if we look at it, we can say, well, obviously magnesium is in group 2. Okay, it's in group 2. So therefore it's got two valence electrons. Happily, oxygen's in group six, so therefore it's got six valence electrons, which means it's got a valency of two. Why? Because it has got the space for two electrons, which will then make it like a noble gas. So what happens is, sorry, I thought there was more writing here. So what would happen is, yeah, the magnesium, okay, and it's got two valence electrons. So the way we would write it is one, two. It is going to give away two electrons and it's going to become magnesium two plus. Okay. Yeah, we've got oxygen. Oxygen has got six valence electrons. So it's got one, two, three, four, five, and six. And you can see that there's a space there and there's space there. It gains those two electrons. So now it becomes, and this is important, it's now full, it becomes oxygen, which is going to be one, two, I'm just drawing it the same way that I drew it before. And then you're going to fill in these two negatives. But now it is a two minus. So the magnesium becomes a cation and the oxygen becomes an anion. And when we write it, we say that magnesium two plus plus oxygen two minus is going to become magnesium oxide. Or if we want to draw it with the little things, if we need to draw it like, let me just show you. Now we want to draw it like this. So the way we do that, with all the writing in it, 
Uh, and now I'm going to go to over. I need more space. Okay, I'm going to write a blurt. But I'm doing it in different colors so you can see what I'm doing. So it's going to be MG. Okay, and it's going to be two dots. Okay, let me just think about this. Yeah, two dots. Two dots. And then plus oxygen, which is oxygen, and it's going to be one, two, three, four, five, six. And what does it become? It becomes Mg plus and then oxygen, and it's going to be one, two, three, four, five, six, and then a dot here, and a dot here, and, and sorry, that's supposed to be two plus, and that's two minus. There you go. Okay, so there we go. That is how the magnesium and oxide are formed into a, um, an, an ionic bond. Right, now, as I was saying, crystal lattice is the thing that these ionic substances form. Basically, your ionic substances don't join. When they form an ionic bond, they don't join just as like covalent bonds do. When you've got per covalent bonds, like water, water is polar covalent. So you've got that big oxygen, and you've got a little hydrogen, and that's a little hydrogen. And then you might have another big oxygen here with a little hydrogen and a little hydrogen. So you've got these separate molecules, okay? We call them discrete molecules. In other words, we can separate them out, okay? Whereas, uh, ionically bonded substances form these giant macromolecules. They're called macromolecules or giant molecules. And basically what happens is, the so because everything's electrostatically attracted to each other, for example, this sodium is surrounded by one, two, three, four, five, and if we carried on, there'd be a sixth chlorine up here, right? If it carried on. And similarly, this chlorine is surrounded by one, two, three, four, five, and six. Okay, so every sodium, except the ones in the ends, is gonna be surrounded by six chloride atoms, and every chloride atom is gonna be surrounded, except for the ones in the ends, is gonna be surrounded by six sodium ions. So it forms a giant crystal lattice. Now let's talk about the properties of the ionic compounds. So ions are arranged in a lattice structure, which means that they are crystalline at room temperature. The thing about the lattice structure is, if you've ever noticed crystals, the crystals that we get are generally ionically bonded, and that's because because of the structure the way, the way it is now, it can easily shear off. So it easily breaks off, for example, along that bond surface there, like in the middle, okay? So that is why crystals tend to be ionic bonded or ionic structures tend to be crystals, if you want to talk about that way. So ionic solids are crystalline at room temperature. Okay, that's important. The ionic bond is a strong electrostatic attraction. Remember electrostatic is an attraction between positive and negative charges. Okay, positive and negative charges. And if we just go back for a second, do you see here that we've got a, a very strong charge uh, I mean, attraction between magnesium, which is positively charged, and oxygen, which is negatively charged as well. And it's 2 plus and 2 minus. So that there is a strong electrostatic charge. Okay, so what does this mean? It means that ionic compounds are hard. They've got high melting points because it takes quite a lot of effort to break down those strong bonds. And therefore, they've got also high boiling points and they're brittle because the fact that they can break along this the surface the same reason that they have these beautiful sheer crystalline structure means that they can break along a specific um, they're not bendy they're going to break along a specific line so for example they could break along that line over there okay so that 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 plane okay so what else? The bonds are broken along the planes when the compound is under pressure. Solid ionic crystals do not conduct electricity. But here's the big thing. Ionic solutions do. And notice we said solutions. Our ionic solutions do. And this, guys, is a very typical exam question. Because what the teacher does, or they'll say, what type of bonding does a substance have 
if when they solid, when they're solid, they do not conduct electricity, but when in solution or molten, they do. And the correct answer is ionically bonded compounds. And the reason is that when they are solid, there are no free ions, okay? But when they are formed solutions or they've melted, they've got free ions, free ions. And it's free ions that transfer electricity, okay? Right, now let's talk about metallic bonding. And the first thing I need to do is get an arrow. Okay, so metallic bonding, oopsie, one minute. There we go. Metallic bonding is electrostatic attraction between the positively charged atomic nuclei of metal atoms and the delocalized electrons of metal. So I've got a little diagram here. It is free. It was free from this website um, under Creative Commons. And basically they are showing how metallic bonding occurs. And what you can see is that the atoms are bonded in a regular, almost like a crystalline structure. Okay, these yeah, are basically the atoms. There's the center bits are the positive nuclei, and this brown or black bit around the edges is supposed to be the orbitals. And what you will notice is the outermost electrons move freely in what is called a sea of delocalized electrons, sea of delocalized electrons. And you need to say that if you ever need to describe anything to do with electro metallic bonding, you need to describe sea of delocalized electrons. So you'll notice that the movements of the electrons seem to be random. Okay, and they are kind of random under normal conditions because of the fact that um, what happens is that the electrons will go around their own orbital like this, okay? But if they get to a point where they join, could join uh, next to another atom, then at this point, if this atom looks like it doesn't have an electron, then the electron's got a chance or an opportunity to either go up and around or it can carry on going around its own atom. So for that reason, it looks like it's moving randomly. However, if we put a positive charge over here and a negative charge over here, what happens is the electrons all flow in the one direction towards the positive pole. So if we just go back for a second, okay, it's gonna tell you that now. Da, 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 da. Here we go, it just repeats. So we just have to wait for it to get to that point so I can show it to you. There we go. So now what happens is you can see it going towards. Now at that point, what is happening is that this, for example, this electron here that is going around this atom is attracted to the positive pole. So then there is an absence of electrons around that atom. So then at that point, the, at the electron that is flowing around this atom could then get to this point of here and go, oh, look, he's missing electron. Let's go there. So what might end up happening is that an atom, an electron might end up going along la 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 like that because it keeps trying to fill the orbital of the atom that is next to it where that atom's electron has been pulled off by the positive charge over here. Okay, and obviously, therefore, it doesn't matter, like we've said before, it doesn't matter which way you let current flow through a piece of metal because the electrons can flow both ways. Okay, so that's metallic bonding. So whenever you talk about metallic bonding, you should be talking about a sea of delocalized, delocalized, electrons, a sea of delocalized electrons. Okay, so let's talk about properties of metals. First of all, metals are shiny. They conduct electrons and we've just explained I mean, electricity and we've just explained why it's because the electrons are free to move. They also conduct heat because the positive nuclei are packed closely together and can transfer the heat. But there's an interesting phenomenon. Okay, what do you think happens to the electricity that is flowing through a metal wire when we heat up the wire? What happens when we heat, 
What happens to the electrical conductivity conductivity when we heat up the metal? Okay, now your gut reaction might be, well, if we're heating it up, we're giving it energy and if we're giving the particles energy then surely they'll move faster and so therefore they will conduct electricity much more easily okay so fair enough there is some logic to that but in fact when it comes to metals it's actually incorrect let me explain why basically if you've got let me just draw this in black so that i can go over it in color okay so Let's pretend you've got your metal wire again, okay? And I'm not going to draw so many layers of electrons, okay? So here we go is, okay, let's make it one atom thick. This is a super skinny, super, super thin um, piece of metal, okay? Ridiculously thin. It's one atom thick, right? So how does this work? What we said was that basically if we put a positive pole over here and a negative pole over here what happens the electrons are going to come along and they're going to go la 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 okay everybody happy with that that's what the electrons are going to do okay possibly okay if we put a positive charge here and a negative charge here they might end up going around twice or something but that's ideally what's going to happen in order for that to happen there has to be an overlap of orbitals if that overlap of orbitals doesn't happen, then this electron cannot move from this atom over here on the left to this atom. You know what? I'm just going to write this a bit bigger. Let me draw it a bit bigger over here. Okay. So they, these atoms have got orbitals, right? Remember that the orbital is where you're most likely to find your electrons. Okay, right. So, and here is your positive nucleus with lots of protons in it so now what happens is like i said the electron comes along now at this point here it can choose depending on what is happening on this atom it can choose to either continue going around its own atom or if this atom looks like it is it's electron deficient like it doesn't have enough electrons then it's going to move around here and again at this point it can decide so if we put a positively charged end of the battery over here what's going to happen is it's going to pull this electron off which then causes all these electrons to come along and there you go okay but now what happens when we heat it up when we heat it up these atoms start moving okay so in the same space you might have this atom and this atom and has had them and over here they're vibrating on the spot okay the atoms are vibrating on the spot but over here because they're hot they are now moving they are moving and they're going ding 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 and yeah they're going ding 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 and yes still are the nuclei right so what happens at the moment if say we take a positive charge i mean positive end of a battery yeah this electron gets pulled off okay this one is now electron deficient it's positively charged it wants this dude's electron it wants the middle dude's electron but the middle dude is over here so what's going to happen this guy on the end has to wait for this elect atom to come near it so it has to wait for this to happen it's going to wait for this one to move over here and it possibly to move over here so that the electron can transfer and only when the orbitals overlap can that electron transfer so therefore there's a little bit of resistance okay what we call resistance in, in electricity terms okay because what is happening is you have to wait for these atoms to actually bounce near each other for the orbitals to overlap and then you've got to hope that the electron is at exactly the right point at the right time so that it can move into the next atoms orbital okay so you understand so actually heating things up makes electricity flow slower so what happens to electrical conductivity when we heat them it goes down it decreases and guys that's why we have got fans on our computers and that's why they use um seriously cool rooms and things when they are trying to 
um, and make sure that the computers run fast and everything else, okay? So, overheating of computers is bad because of the main thing, conducting electricity. Right, moving on. Metals have a high melting point, high melting point, because the bonds are strong and a high density because of the tight packing of the nuclei. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, so what, sorry, just by the way, what does that mean? It means that it sinks in water, okay? So in other words, how do we make metal pieces float? Well, we actually, we actually do what? We fill it with air, okay? Just in case you guys don't know this. Okay, if you take a container, and I'm sure you did this when you were in grade eight or in grade nine, and you took a container and you filled it with water and you took a piece of clay, Okay, let's just say clay, and you take the clay and you drop it into the water. What takes? What happens to the clay? It goes to the bottom. Okay, but if you take the clay and you make it into a shape like a little boat, okay, I cannot draw to save my life, and you put it over here, then it will float. It might go a little bit down into the water, but it will float. And the reason for that is because of the air, because air is less dense. Similarly, metal boats float for the same reason. And that is why I'm telling you about this. Okay, because most boats these days are either made of fiberglass or metal. Right, let's move on. Right, so now we've spoken about the different types of bonding, and we've spoken about the fact that bonding is done because we want to make atoms join up together to form compounds that are neutral. In other words, they look like or feel to themselves like they are noble. So what happens is we then need to write, be able to write the formula of the new compounds. And there is a what is called a compound ion table. Okay. So in other words, these compounds so these ions are compound because they're made up of two or more atoms and they're the common ones, the ones that we often see. So grade 10s, what I do when I'm teaching my grade 10s is I actually give them this table and then I mark off the ones that I say are important and then I make them go learn it. And then I give them a little test the next day and don't worry, it's not a punishment test. If they get full marks, they get a little chocolate, okay? But the reason I do that is because in order to be able to write out your chemical formula, you need to know that carbonate is CO3 to minus, okay? You need to know ammonium, um, chromate, you don't need to know cyanide. I'm just giving you the ones that are most important. Hydroxide manganate, nitrate, nitrite, oxide, actually you don't need to know oxide, permanganate you do need to know though, manganate and permanganate you do need to know, phosphate, sulfate, sulfite. Okay, those there that I've made crosses on, not this oxide because that's straight with the periodic table, these compound ions are the ones that come up most often, okay? So, for example, I may say to you that in the fertilizer industry, you've made ammonium nitrate. Okay, you need, if you know the formula, you can go, well, ammonium is NH4 plus and your nitrate is NO3 minus. 1 plus cancels with 1 minus, so therefore I can just write this as NH4, NO3, okay? So there you go, you've written ammonium nitrate. However, if I say to you that it's ammonium sulfate, sulfate, by the way, in the latest textbooks, you'll notice that your sulfate and your sulfur and your sulfide are all written with Fs, and that's because a new official designation of sulfur is with an F. But a lot of the textbooks you guys are using still have the pH. It's not a big deal. There's a period of integration, so you can still use pH. I myself have always preferred the pH, but now apparently it's a law that we have to use F. I don't know why. Okay, so let's get back to ammonium sulfate. Ammonium, we've just said, is NH4+. plus. Sulfate is SO4 2 minus. So if we think about this, what are we saying? We're saying that ammonium's got 
a plus it's got one arm that can bind sulfate is SO4 to minus so it's got two arms so to fill up your sulfate what do we need we need two ammoniums we need another ammonium to join up to the two sulfates so that both these pluses cancel out with both the minuses. So if I now know this, I can say, well, therefore, this is going to be written as NH4 2 SO4. I've got two ammonium ions joining up with the sulfate ion to make this compound. Okay, so you really do need to learn these. Right, so now just as much as what I've been showing you how to do this, we are now going to practice a little bit of this. And what I would really urge you to do grade 10s is if you are following along in this lesson, I'm doing this quite slowly so you guys can beat me to it very easily, okay? But if you're not doing watching this live, then I would suggest you pause it at this point and try and write all the formula in and the names, okay? And once you have done that, then you can actually see, carry on with the video and see if you got it right. Okay, so I just want to check one thing with you. Do you agree that I have told you you didn't have to learn it, but they on this form have used, um, in fact, I don't know if it's here, chromate, dichromate, I'm not seeing it. Okay, dichromate's not on here. And phosphate hydrogen phosphate there. They've used hydrogen phosphate. Okay, they've used hydrogen phosphate on this question paper, but they've told you it's HF4, H of, okay, right. So now, so let's go through it. So what we're going to do is we're going to combine, as you've shown before, yes, yeah, sodium with bromine to give you sodium bromide, magnesium with bromide to give magnesium bromide, etc., etc. We're not going to do all of them because we don't have time to do all of them. But we're going to do the most important one. So let's just make sure that you can do it. So this is sodium, which is Na plus, and this is sulfur, which is S2 minus. So do you agree there's one plus here and two minuses here? So I need two of those. Let me write it here. We've got Na plus and we've got S2 minus. So do you agree I need two sodiums to join up with the sulfur to balance it, okay, to make it neutral. So do you agree it's going to be Na2S, okay, I need two sodiums for the one sulfur, okay. So the, this one over here, what do we need? This is magnesium and this is sulfur and they both have the same number, so that is obviously just going to be MgS. This is aluminium 3 plus and this is S2 minus, okay. So Aluminium 3 plus basically means the same that as saying aluminium has got three arms. We're now joining it up with a sulfur. Okay, so let's say we're doing sulfur. But sulfur's only got two arms. So now what do I do? I have to join another sulfur over here. But now do you see there's a problem that we're now missing some aluminiums? So we write, okay, fine, aluminium, one, two, three. And then we go, well, that's okay, because if I add another sulfur, we're all sorted. Okay, so do you see, therefore, we can say that we've got aluminium 2S3, okay? Aluminium 2S3. But now I want you to notice something about this one and this one. Yeah, you've got Br1- minus and aluminium 3 plus. And the bonding was ALBR3. Yeah, you got aluminium 3 plus and you got S2 minus. And you'll notice it's aluminium 2 and S3 plus, S3. So what is actually happening is there's a swapping happening. So in other words, it's aluminium 3 plus and then it's going to be S2 minus and you swap the numbers. So it's aluminium 2 S3. That's all that happens with these. Okay, so if we're using that rule, this is NH4 plus and this is S2 minus. So that's going to be NH4 2 S. Okay, you didn't have to put brackets here. I don't know why they put brackets. You didn't have to put brackets there, but you do have to put brackets here because we're showing this is a 2. 
Okay, similarly, yeah, we've got H and S2, so it's going to be H2S, and this is called hydrogen sulfide. This is ammonium sulfide, this is aluminium sulfide, this is magnesium sulfide, and this is sodium sulfide. Okay, so those are all the sulfides. Okay, I'm not going to do this one, but I am going to do, let's do dichromate. This here is dichromate. Okay, I just want to check that it's not on the, oh, I can't see it, dihydrogen phosphate. I don't even have chromate. It's, oh, there's chromate. Okay, so chromate, there you go. Chromate is CrO42 minus. Dichromate is CrO2072 minus. And you guys should actually learn this one as well. So add it onto your table of what you should learn. That's important. Okay, so again, you can see that this is 2 minus and this is plus. Okay, so what you need to do, you need to swap them. Okay, so you've got Na plus and you got cr 2072 minus so what are you doing you're swapping so it becomes na2 cr207 okay we've swapped it so if you're at that then what is this this is going to be sodium dichromate that's all it is sodium dichromate okay exactly the same thing the whole time okay so what i would suggest you guys do is try these practice them try them if you don't get them right you can either ask me you can message me guys if you join the class then you can actually message me and it's anonymous it's fairly anonymous so in other words when i say fairly you can put any name in um so i won't know who you are okay but the whole point is that you can ask me what questions you can say. Well, I really struggled with the formula. Can we practice some more? Or we can do some exam questions. Um, otherwise, go look in your textbooks or ask your teachers, okay? That's the way this is supposed to be. It's supposed to be an aid. It's not to take, it's supposed to take the place of your teachers. Right, now let's talk about a relative molecular mass. Now, relative molecular mass is the combined mass of the atoms that are bonded covalently. For example, ammonia. So, if we look on the periodic table, we've just blown this periodic table up a lot, okay? You can find the molar mass of your nitrogen and your hydrogen, but they're three hydrogens, okay? So, do you agree that we're finding... Sorry, I was going to see something. Okay, now. We're finding the molar mass of this, and it says relative, because of the fact that it's a couple of things. One is that this year, this 1,0079 is an average, okay, an average. What happens is you guys get isotopes. I'm sure you guys know about isotopes already, but just to remind you, an isotope is an atom with a different number of neutrons. So why is that important? Well, that's important because if it has a different number of neutrons, it has a different mass, and this is to do with mass. So they've worked out the average molecular mass or average atomic mass of all these different atoms, and we will do calculations on that when we do go through stoichiometry. But at the moment, you can just see that these are the average or relative atomic masses. So when we use relative molecular mass, we find in the atomic mass, a relative atomic mass of a molecule. So we've got nitrogen, which is 14.00674, which we tend to use as 14, plus 3 times hydrogens, which is 1, which is 17. So the relative molecular mass of ammonia is 17. Right, now let's look at the relative molecular mass of sodium chloride. And what's important is it actually doesn't matter how it's bonded. It doesn't matter if it's bonded with sodium or if it's bonded, I mean, bonded ionically or covalently, the relative molecular mass or the formula mass is actually calculated the same. However, there's a difference in name. Notice that this is relative molecular mass, where this is relative formula mass. And the reason is because 
covalently bonded things form molecules. Like I said before, like with the water where I said, oh, look, this is a water molecule, that's a water molecule, they're covalently bonded. So relative molecular mass is basically exactly what we've just said, but of something that's covalently bonded. Whereas the formula mass is something that's bonded ionically. Okay, for example, sodium chloride. So you've got sodium, which is 22.99. So that's 22,99 plus the chlorine, which is 35,45. So let's write it over here 22,99 and 35,45. And grade 10s, by the way, it doesn't matter what my periodic table tells you or your periodic table tells you the um, atomic mass is the rate of atomic mass is. You use the one that they keep giving you in the exam. So if they give you one that says that the rate of atomic mass of sodium is 23, you use 23, whatever they give you. So if I add this, this becomes a 4 and that becomes a 4 and that's a 7 and that's a 5. So the rate of atomic mass of or the rate of formula mass of sodium chloride is 57,44. Right, now let's do some exam questions. And I think before we carry on with this, I think we're going to leave this for the next lesson because it's now time. I would really like to suggest that if you struggled with any of this, to go through and watch the video again. And then go through your textbook and your notes and make sure you understand it. And then next week, well, next lesson, we will, which is on Thursday, we will work through the exam questions and then move on to a different section. Have a great day.